the panel is here. NBC News Managing Washington Editor Carol Lee, former Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson, and Mark Short, former Chief of Staff to Vice President Mike Pence. Thank you for all of you for being here today. Carol, let me start with you and just set the stage because you have some news that you just reported out moments ago, which is basically that the president's top advisor in the Middle East is heading to Israel. What do you know? Well, that's right, Kristen. Brett McGurk, the president's top ad- Middle East advisor, is scheduled to he- to the Middle East this week. He'll go to Israel, and his, his mission is to focus on the release of hostages. He's also going to Qatar, which has been key in these negotiations over the release of hostages. And they're exploring multiple options, the administration is. And one of those options is securing the release of about 80 women and children who are being held hostage. And in exchange for that, the release of Palestinian women and teenagers that are being held by Israel. It's one option. There's no guarantee that any of this is going to succeed, but Brett McGurk is going to travel there to try to move this forward. And it all comes as the administration is trying to weigh its support with Israel and its growing concerns about how Israel is carrying out this war. In particular, there is concerns. Officials tell me that Israel is not doing enough to try to minimize civilian casualties. There are officials that that don't believe that Israel cares, that the Israeli Mm. government cares, that public opinion is turning against them. And it all comes as conversations, I'm told, between Israeli officials and U.S. officials are getting increasingly testy. And at the same time, Kristen, we're told that there's no change in the strategy, that the the administration is going to stand with Israel. They're continuing to give the, the support that it needs, that President Biden feels like his approach has given him the influence that he needs to get things like pauses and humanitarian aid. Well, it's such great reporting. And Jay, it takes me to my next point, because you heard Prime Minister Netanyahu's defiance when I pressed him on this idea that there are protests all around the world calling for a ceasefire, calling for an end to the civilian deaths. If the reporting is to be believed, uh, civilian deaths in Gaza are about to become 10 times the number of Mm. Israeli deaths on October 7th. Uh, Prime Minister said that the Israeli Defense Forces are not targeting civilians. Of course they're not targeting civilians. No one really believes that they're targeting civilians. However, you can target the enemy, the terrorist, and have a callous disregard for civilian deaths and violate the laws of armed conflict. And that's the rising concern across the across the globe right now. I give the administration, the Biden administration, a lot of credit for firmly standing behind Israel right after October 7th, but also publicly and privately uh, warning the government of Israel about civilian casualties, about the possibility of a ceasefire, uh, getting humanitarian aid. They're walking a fine line, but I think our government is doing the best it can right now. And Mark, weigh in on this, because politically speaking, Republicans this week had a debate. They largely stood firmly by Israel, just as the Biden administration has been doing. On Capitol Hill, a battle is playing out about how to get funding for Israel. It's not included in this first proposal to keep the government open. How much urgency do you think there is to get something passed on Israel aid? I think there's urgency, and I think Speaker Johnson is uniquely positioned right now in a very uh, divided conference to help unite it and get that done. I don't know that I accept the premise, though, Kristen, your question, that the House Republicans and the people on the stage are in the same position as the Biden administration. I do think the Biden administration is getting weak need on this. I think it's concerning. There's never been, there's not been an attack in 80 years like this on the Israeli and Jewish people. We're seeing a rise of anti-Semitism like we have not seen, Mm -hmm. and yet the messaging is concerned about Islamophobia. I think the reality is we need to stand with Israel right now. And I think the Republicans on that stage and Republican members of Congress are willing to do that. Jay, what's your reaction to what Mark just said? I I mean, I agree. I think we need to stand by Israel. Uh, I see public opinion, political opinion in this country shifting, as Carol pointed out. And uh, increasingly, as the civilian deaths in Gaza are highlighted every night on the news, um, you know, opinion in Congress may shift as well. But um, this is a very tough situation. It sure is. And it's all coming against the backdrop of these election results that we saw on Tuesday. Carol, and because you never sleep, you have more reporting uh, about all of this as well. And the fact that this was a mixed week for Democrats, they had wins on Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. Uh, On the flip side, they had some 
uh, poll numbers that were really troubling to them, the fact that Biden trails Trump in five out of six key battleground states, and then Senator Joe Manchin announcing he's not running for re-election. If you look at the battleground map, it shows you just how tough it is for Democrats to hold on to the Senate. There you see Ohio, Arizona, the toss-ups. What's the strategy that you're hearing within the Biden campaign? Well, first on Senator Manchin, the White House tried to convince him to run for re-election. Obviously, that, that didn't work. The, the officials that I've talked to said that they don't think he'll ultimately run third party, but they don't actually really know. They think that he's worried about his legacy, doesn't want to be seen as electing former President Trump, and also has a good relationship with President Biden and wouldn't want to do, put him in that position. So there's that. In terms of where the president and his team are after those polls and the election, I'm told that the president is feeling really good after that Tuesday's election, that he also heard privately from allies of his that he needs to take the fight to President, former President Trump much more directly. And he made a concerted decision to do that at an event with union workers where he went after the president, former president and said, look, I've been there for you and I hope you remember that. And he also took him, uh, called him out on abortion and, and it's supposed to it's increase. He's going to increasingly do that. And, and Jay, I mean, take us inside what Democrats are saying. Are alarm bells going off? And, and is this the right shift in strategy? As Carol says, the president's going to shift to taking on Trump. He's in campaign mode now, despite the fact the White House said they were going to wait until the spring. First of all, we're a year from the election. <laughs> I agree with David Brooks. Polls are where people vent. It's not where they <laughs> vote. And when you look at you look, you look at history, you look where Obama was in 2011, mm -hmm. you look where Barack Obama was in 2007, 30 points behind Hillary Clinton right now. So it, it's, it's still a long way to go. I do not believe Joe Manchin is going to be a third party candidate for president. I don't think he wants to be perceived as the spoiler that handers the, hands the election to Donald Trump. Yeah. So it, it's, it's still a long way. Mark, what do you make of this moment and what we all witnessed on Tuesday night? How much do you think abortion is a motivating factor for the Democratic base, and how concerned are Republicans about that? Well, I think the Republican Party needs pro-life voters, and the reality is the party needs to continue to be the party for life. Uh, there's no doubt that right now the left is more energized since the Dobbs decision than the right is. I think that's apparent. But I also think that accepting, that, I think, as Tim Scott said on your debate stage, accepting a, a press... A a, a minimum that says when a baby can feel pain, that's where we're going to protect life, I think is is generally supported by a majority of Americans. I don't think we've articulated that well. And I think we need to contrast the Democrat position, which is abortion on demand up until birth, which is far just more in line with North Korea and China than it is with the developed world. I mean, the, the position of taking a... a limiting abortion once you can begin to feel pain is even to the left of where France and Macron is, where the limit is 12 to 14 weeks. All right. Okay. Thank you guys for a great conversation. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.